thanks ever sponsor uh, who made this evening possible for all of us. And I also want to thank the students in particular because this is your effort. This is your motivation to learn more about other countries, to learn you know, from the first-hand experienced person like myself, because maybe most of you, like I heard that some high school students are here, with a, which is a great thing. I love talking to them. Uh, I'm not that old from high school students, and even those university students are here. I'm 27 years of age. I have started going to school first time ever in my life, at age of 21 in 2000. Uh, at Boston Evening Academy uh, High School. And I will share that experience with you, how it feels like to go to school when you're 21 years old. Never had any basic you know, education before in any language. It's not a matter only to say English, though the people speak English here, but not even in my native language, Dinka, or a second language, Arabic. I had to start from blows you. So I want to thank you in advance and I want to apologize as I just mentioned that excuse for you I had learned English for only uh, eight years. I've been in the United States in 1999. Please be careful my English not greater as you can uh, maybe assume. I'm not like yours but I'm doing my best because the story that made me to be here with you is one of the most things that concern me than anything else I do in my daily actually life. I'm here not just to bring you back uh, to all this memory and thing that I have gone through from age 7 to 17. It is an issue as well to educate that but most important I'm here as a representative of those who cannot be here with us. I'm here representing the 27 million people who are still enslaved globally. I'm here to represent the people of Sudan people of Southern Sudan, where I am from, people of Darfur, in the western part of Sudan, where the current situation that most of you might be familiar with, I'm here to represent all the people globally and people of the United States, because the United States is my second country, it's my second home, that I always, you know, say thank you to the United States, thank you to people of the United States for not only giving me a second chance at life, to relive my dreams again because today my dreams rise again. Over 10 years ago, I used to lie awake at night and wondered who's going to come and free me when I was enslaved. And I'm so thankful that I had maintained and able to accomplish my dreams by escaping and made my way to the United States of America. Thank you, people of the United States. Thank you, America. This is a, such a great pleasure for me to really take you back, you know, to share with you the details of how I became a slave. It was some time, as you heard from the introducer, in 1986, I was seven years old, like others, seven years old and six years old and 10 years old and 11 years old in the United States. Kids who go to school in the morning, when they came, they actually welcome home by their parents and sister and brothers and provide them with food and their toys and watch their favorite cartoon or any other, you know, TV channel they like. But kid in southern Sudan, unlike kids here or elsewhere, we do not have, you know, that many shores we do because southern Sudan never been stable. You know, kids don't watch cartoon, they don't even know TV or radio or any other stuff. They don't go to school. They only woke up in the morning and sit underneath the tree and go out, sit alone because women are always a unique people. They always sit alone and practice, think that when you grow up become, you know, a woman, you know, this is what you will do, you know, how to know how to cook well, how to set up your house well, how to clean your house. And I remember we used to group ourselves, boys and girls, though that we are all about the same age. And the boys actually go to a nearby, you know, river and bring all this big mud. And we put that mud down and we start actually making cows. You know, we compete of who will make 
a lot of cows a day. I always want to be number one. I always want to be on the top of everything. Even when it's difficult, when I compete with the difficult guys that work faster than I, have the same you know, determination, I still say to them, I will not give up. You know, I will work hard and I will advance myself because when you had actually abandoned something, it means that you lose. And I never say it is too big or it is this and that, all these excuses that we all know. I will say I can do it and I definitely succeed when I say that. You can tell from example that been here, nobody really told me, Francis, you are now free, go. No, nobody. But I did it. I said to myself, I want to be free. I tried, and it worked out. And those who didn't try it are still there now. So um, it was that evening, you know, while I was playing with my friends, from the neighbor, my mother come and she said, Pure, I want to send you to a local market to sell cooked eggs and peanuts. And uh, I said to my friends, I know you're all going to beat me, but I will catch up tomorrow. I want to go do this favor for my mother. My mother talked to one of the girls. She was about 15 years old. She's our neighbor. Her name is Jabal. I still remember. She said, you go with Francis and make sure that you wash him and make sure that you take the money away from him when there's any customer purchase something. She was very kind, young girl, and we went to local market walking, actually, because people in southern Sudan, as I said, you know, walk by foot. You know, there's no public transportation. When we got there, we sat underneath the big tree, and uh, there was a lot of people, like us sitting here. People are selling and buying, coming from all different villages. And uh, while we were sitting there, I heard some people talking about the smoke. And they were pointing towards our village. And I did not realize something had occurred actually as soon as uh, we left there. And some also saying that they heard gun shooting. These things were just a normal thing to me as a young, you know, and many other kids. We did not know what will happen at that marketplace or what had already happened behind us. But these people were saying the real things. You know, they were saying that they are a Mura Halin or those so-called today in Darfur are Jinjaweed had already come and occupied our village. And they start killing people. And they start actually capturing women and children. And they were marching them to come to the marketplace where we were. And now, uh, because the Sudanese government in Khartoum supplies this Arab militia, Arab tribes, they are the cattle people like us too. And we're neighboring each other. Darfur is not that far from my, actually, county in particular, or my state called Awil. It's a northern Barkazal, which is, we actually just separated each other. There's a river between us called Badar Arab. We call it in a native language, Kir. And that's only separated us from them. And they crossed that. And when they crossed, they definitely approached to our area. So these militiamen, you know, supplied by the Sudanese government by giving them guns and everything. And they told them, go there and kill the women and children. You know, I mean, kill the men and take women and children and bring them to slavery. That day, my parents were killed. My mom, my dad, and two sisters, and many other relatives. I did not know, though. I said that in advance because that's what happened when I learned three years later when I came to the United States. That's when I learned that my parents were killed the same day I was captured. The same militiamen have actually marched to the, that local market, and they stormed that local market. And it was just like a nightmare when I see people shouting and asking for help. Everyone, including myself, when I see ever directions were stormed by these mad people, rushing in with machine guns, they start shooting. I saw many, many people that I couldn't even count, men and women and even children on the ground. 
you see them on the ground like they just decided to relax, actually, but they were dead bodies. That was my first time to witness such violence like what I saw uh, that evening. I stood up. I was actually trying to get away from that situation, but there's no exit. Nowhere you can go. Everywhere is actually stoned by these people with a gun. They actually rushed collecting women and children, and I were captured by this, you know, uh, man. His name Jim Abdullah. He grabbed my hands and he was speaking to me in a strange language I couldn't understand at that time. He was speaking to me in Arabic, and I'd never spoken Arabic before. He dragged me and put me with a kid who were captured. And I watched them destroying everything on the market, and of course they were stealing other things that they needed to take with them. And afterward, they marched over to the north. Uh, I will not share with you about what happened on the way, but one thing I can share with you, the young girl that I saw was shot in front of all of us. She was screaming, saying that she'd seen her mother and father killed. They burned them at the big hut. Actually, people refused. The women refused to go with them. They put them in the big hut like this and burned it. And she was captured. That's from our village. And she was saying, why did they kill my mother and father? You know, and one of the militia men told her to stop. And she couldn't stop crying. And what they did, they took her out of the group. And she was shot on the head. It was a sign for all of, all of us, all the kids and even the adults that were captured women to be silent. I also learned a lot of things on the way that we're doing to the women. And this is something that I wish you, all these young women and anybody that want to know, but you know, what happened specifically to the women when they captured and during the time when they captured them? Because again, you have heard that we talk about human trafficking, like that you heard here when I hear about the human trafficking thing that happened to women in this nation or wherever they traffic to you have heard, and I will not mention definition. So um, I had witnessed all that, and when we actually come to area where these people live, all of us were divided up to militiamen, and I ended up living with Jim Abdullah, uh, who became uh, my master for the next 10 years. I remember at that time when we were divided up, the young girl that I mentioned, her name Nibol, she was screaming my name. She was saying, Puel, why are you leaving me? Puel is my African name, and Francis, of course, is mine, because my parents are Christians. And I couldn't speak. She was saying, why are you going with that strange man? Why don't you come with me? And she was taken by someone else, too. If you can ask me today where she's at, I would tell you I don't know. That was my first time to hear from her and to see her in 1986 when I was seven years old. And you can imagine I'm 27 today. That's a 20 years later. And when I was taken to this uh, person's farm, he called the old family. It's like some people when you buy a new house here or a new car and you have friends, you call them to come and see it and to say to you congratulations. You know, and uh, when I was actually taken there, I saw the family was standing there, and I thought they may go and receive me well. But I see everyone laughing and shouting, saying, Abit, Abit, and I did not even know what Abit mean. Abit mean black slave. That was my welcome. You know, and I saw my master's wife running around talking to her husband, you know, saying that, don't let them look at me. You know, and saying that she didn't like me. You know, her husband should just get ready of me and go bring other slaves. Kill me. And uh, they sent their children to beat me. And it was three of them beating at me. I was crying aloud and nobody helped me. Until afterward I stopped. I was very angry even though I was young. I said, I never ever seen, you know, such horrible people who don't even, you know, think about seven years old. Why, what is my guilt? Why are they allowing their children to beat me? And why mother and father and other, and even grandmother, 
washing and they're not helping me. That was my first question, but I did not ask that question because there's no way for me to communicate with them. They don't speak my native language, Dinka, and I don't speak the language Arabic. All they were telling me, they tell me using the sign language to me uh, to understand what they tell me. And after the kid got tired, they tell them to leave. And my master actually did uh, said to me to follow him and he showed me a small shelter that close to the animals. And I wasn't surprised that Juma has a lot of animals, cows and horses and donkeys and camels and goats because my people, Dinka people, are a cattle people. We love cattle like Texas people. We love cows. <laughs> yeah, we love cows and we love all kind of animals. So, um, but one thing that surprises me though, I was forced to sleep next to them. And I was too young, I was, you see all these big, you know, horses and big, you know, camels and cows. And, uh, and I was afraid that they would kill me. And uh, I have a lot of complaints, but there's no way to complain them. Until uh, one day I said to myself, I want to learn the language these people speak so I can ask them three questions. Only three questions in million questions that I have. I said if I'm able to ask, I will ask three questions. It did not took me a short time to, learn, to ask those questions. It took me uh, maybe uh, several years to learn Arabic a little bit. And when I learned a little bit of Arabic, broken Arabic, my English is better now. Um, you know, I asked three questions one day. I, one of the first questions when my master come to me, he actually bring me food, his wife done come close by me. If she come close by me, she will come and tell me, don't move, don't move your head, stay straight, and she will come and spit in my eyes. If I look at her, she said, don't look at me. Though that you can't judge your eyes where you look like, because you look here and there. And sometimes if she passing by and by mistake I look at her, she will come and say, don't move, stay there and will come and spit in my eyes. And nobody would tell her why. Uh, and I don't know why she hated me, you know. Um, I said, is this her, her children? Why she hated me like this? What did I do? And uh, for 10 years, to be honest with you, she never ever smile or even say anything nicer to me, ever. And I'm not saying she's the only one, but her the worst. Her husband, of course, talked to me, but she only talked to me about his business, <coughs> taking care of his cattle, you know, moving me from this job to that job, but nothing nicer. He never come and say, how did you sleep last night? Are you okay? You know, or even when I'm sick, when I say sick, they can see it or smell it, but they never cares. You know, they never cares, and just by miracle I survive. When anything serious happened to me, I will say, God, please help me. Uh, and, uh, and I remember when I was young, my mother tried to preach me about the Christianity. She always say, uh, do you know your name is Francis? And I say, I don't know. She will explain to me. And then she say, do you know also when you are alone or two of you, uh, you know, do you know that God is among you? You know, she always say, God is Son, Jesus Christ is always with you and love you and always guided you in anything that, you know, you are doing. And I remember that, you know, I say I'm not alone, though that I see only cows and all these animals, God is watching. God would not allow anything bad to happen to me. Maybe that's sort of, you know, what kept me going and, and made me survive you know, all that, you know, horrible years with this family I'm describing to you. Uh, when, you know, so when I asked them the first question, why he forced me to sleep with the animals, and why, uh, you know, they called me a beat, black slave, and why nobody loves me, it took him a second to respond, and then he walked back. He did not say anything, and he grabbed, grabbed his Favorite stick, he has favorite stick that he beat me actually. That he put somewhere that he go and take it whenever he wants to beat me. And he started beating me. 
You know, he beat me, and then he said to me, the reason we call you a beat, black slave, and force you to sleep with the animals, is because you are an animal. That's what he said to me. I did not say anything back to him because I don't have freedom to say it. You know, but I was very, very angry afterward. I said to myself, I'm not an animal, I'm a human being. All my parents, you know, love me. My brothers, my sisters, and even my stepmother and my mother, everybody in the community loved me. Why are these people calling me an animal? That's really made me very angry. You know, I started living double life from that day on. I work hard every day. Just imagine being a young person. And you're the first one to walk up in the morning and the last one to go to bed. That was my life routine. I never complained, but I work hard every day. I knew one day, as I mentioned to you in the beginning of my speech, I'm a man who doesn't give up. I said, one day I'm going to be a free man. You know, I managed. I said, one day I want to escape when I was 10 age of 14. It was one of the tough decisions to make. I just ran away and I left the cows alone. One morning, seven years later, after I worked with them, I was 14, and I was caught by one of the family members, and he brought me back, and my master beat me, and he said if I tried to escape again, he would kill me. But in my heart, I didn't give up. I said I'd rather die than be a slave, because I hate the way they treat me, and also the way they treat other slaves. One of the neighbor, actually, guy, he's one of the richest guy with the camels in the area. He only owns camels. He doesn't have any others. Maybe he have two, three, four camels or, I mean, uh, horses or donkeys. But he earns all, you know, kind of different, you know, camel. They call them different names. And people come and purchase from him in that neighborhood. He has one slave, and I know this slave's name. His name is Badjuk. Badjuk, Badjuk. First name and last name almost the same. I can't spell it for you. And uh, he's a Dinka tribe as well. He was captured about the same time when I was captured. And this young man was forced to take care of all these camels. And you can tell from the height that camel has, they're lazy. And when this kid complained, you know, about the work, they always beat him. And one day, he was sick, very sick, and his master forced him to go after them, and he refused. He said, no, I can't handle them today. I'm extremely sick. His master said, go, you have no excuse for whatsoever. He said, okay, he went, and then he left them alone and come home. So when he came home, his master started beating him, and he cut off his left leg. And he said, because you're lazy, I'm going to make you stay home. One evening, I did not know what I did, uh, and my master beat me. He said, I want to show you an example, and you come with me. You know, he was riding his favorite donkey, and I was walking, you know, beside him. And when we got to that neighbor's house, he said, go to that room and ask that boy in your language. He speaks the same language you speak. And when I see him, I start crying. I asked him what his name, he said his name Barjok, Barjok, and I said my name, and he said, my town and your town is not far away, I mean your village and my village are close by. He was captured one of the villages we passed by after the raid my village and my actually uh, local market. He lived one of the mar uh, market, he was captured one of the market called Masharadut, you know, uh, and uh, he said, uh, I lost my leg because I, I did not do the work. And if you also force to do the work, please don't ever refuse. Even when you can walk, just do your best. God may help you. He said, I don't know my fate if I will survive because I'm not worth it anymore. I will not do the same job that I used to do. Maybe they will get ready of me. And I started crying. And him, my master, and his friend were watching. And when I started crying, he come and slapped me on the face, and he told me to leave, to go back with him. That pain had never gone, gone away from me. And even today, 
you know, it's what made me actually to forget my young life as like other young immigrants who come from different countries and go to school and do good things for their future and future of their country or family. But when I came here, I choose to do this kind of work that I'm doing. When I started, I can bury. You can barely hear what I'm saying. You can come even closer and you still can get it in 2000. But I work hard every day. And I learn a lot from you. I learn my English from you, from the students, from everybody that I talk to. I say this is the most important story to learn. You know, if you say this is not happening to me or happening to anyone I know, it's happening in my country, if you say this is none of your business, you're wrong. This is everyone's business. Even you are sitting here in comfort and freedom, it is your business. It is your potential to do whatever you can because we all have common sense as a human being. People who always, you know, want to be respect, you know, and allowed to live any kind of life that you wish to live. This is just experience of eight years I've been in America talking to you, but there are people who cannot even explain to you what happened to them. And they will never have that chance to even be free to tell their story. And that's why I say after I come here, I can just live my life as individual and forget about what I had gone through and what my people are still going through. And in other nations that I heard that are estimated of 27 million people are still enslaved worldwide. Because slavery is not history. You know, um, if you ask me again about Berjuk, what happened to him, I would tell you I don't know. He may be alive, maybe with that one leg left, or dead. He's not the only one. If you ever seen some other pictures on the TV when they show things, even in Darfur now, you see some kids you know, their fingers chopped up or arm um, or whatever. I've seen that. So many, more than 50 people just, you take one leg here and one arm here and you can't balance yourself to stand. I see those torture. I've seen them. For people that I speak to them in the same language, they may not be alive even now. So I am here to challenge you, friends. I'm here to challenge you because I know I have already challenged many, many kids in the United States and Canada uh, during my time when I be turned to become a young abolitionist and I always tell them it is also your turn to do whatever you can with your freedom that you have because what is good your freedom if you don't use it to help also those who are living a dream of freedom. When I was enslaved for 10 years, I used to lie awake at night and wonder who's going to come and free me. Nobody come, but I did made it, and God, God has freed me, I should say. But what about those, you know, who are still there? I want you and I to help free them. I want you to prevent it from happening to any other generation. It doesn't matter if it's not happening in your country in your neighborhood or anyone you know, as I said earlier. But it is important to prevent it from happening to human beings. Because we all have common sense. And that is what I ask young American students and ask young, uh, um, you know, international students who I sometimes meet. You know, some surprise me, even some from Eastern Africa where we close by, they say we don't know anything what's going on in Sudan because the government pretend not to tell the truth as well. They're blinded or whatever it is, or so government tell them don't say it, and nobody want to get in trouble. I want to be in trouble, and I am in trouble. Hey, and I'm proud, I'm happy. I have this potential to stand up for my people. I have this potential to stand up for others, and I will not be scared for whatever people tell me. I had already seen people coming towards me at the American campuses, and even doing a TV show or radio talk shows, I had people threaten me, tell me that don't do it. If you continue to do it, you will see. 
I tell them, friend, I will not stop. I will not stop until I see my people are free at last. Because two millions of my people have been killed in southern Sudan during the 21 civil war. That includes my parents. You know, when I travel to other states, you know, I always surprised because anywhere you go, you meet Sudanese. I came here last night, I met refugees from Sudan. And I knew them back in Egypt. Everywhere you go. I believe in every state in America, in every country, like Canada, and I heard there's all Sudanese all over the world, include Spain country. So um, I would never listen to these people because they are the people that, you know, blinded you. Because nobody ever has spoken out, and our government can do it alone. We need to bother them. We need to shame our government here. We need to talk to our Congress, our senators, you know, write a letter to, uh, yeah, write a letter to uh, State Department and uh, actually the White House. We need to talk to everybody, include our, you know, pastors and rabbis, anybody that we need to tell them, our parents, this is happening, you know, and, and I could tell you, today Sudan look a little okay in southern Sudan conflict and, and the northern Sudanese government in Khartoum because with help of the students that I have met and understand the issue that I talk about, they have written numerous letters to their leaders and they have, their leaders have challenged president and now there's a peace accord has signed a year ago in Sudan between the South Sudan rebels, us and the Sudanese government in Khartoum uh, in January 2005, though it wasn't a successful, you know, peace agreement because soon after that, maybe a few months, you know, our leader, our beloved brother and leader Dr. John Grung had died or killed on the helicopter crash between Sudan border and Uganda. Uh, he came to visit his colleague from his school, the president of Uganda, and on his way going home, he didn't make it. We saw the news here in America on an Arabic TV, Al Jazeera, uh, you know, John Garang died on the helicopter crash. He agreed to become uh, the first vice president and president of the government of southern Sudan, you know, and uh, he only Work at his office for three weeks in Khartoum, the capital, as a vice president to uh, Omar al-Bashir, the man that maybe you saw him at the UN General Assembly. He was speaking there, and uh, we were very angry because he's the man who fought this war for us. You know, he's the man that we hope that he will bring, you know, democracy in our country because he's well educated. He was here in the United States. He gave up his wonderful life and took the risk to help his people. He's not with us at, today, but we have someone replace him, General Salfa Kirmayar. He's not as successful, you know, but he's a military man and he's, uh, he's doing his best now. And we are worried that the war may start again because the Sudanese government now not even follow, following the uh, what we had agreed on. They're busy with the issue of Darfur because they're still killing our people. This is when we actually are about to sign the peace with them in 2003. And you know that's when the war started in Darfur region. They shifted the war immediately to Darfur region, killing black Muslim there. And we thought, you know, people in Darfur wouldn't have any problem because they are Muslims. Every single black person that is Muslims, except those of us in the South who are Christians, animists, traditional believers, we thought the war would declare against us because we refused to accept Islamic law, a Sharia law, and changing our identity as a black African to be Islamized and Arabized. We thought that was an issue, but we did not that people of Darfur will be uh, killed, and now they are dying. You've seen that on the news a lot, uh, and uh, it is very I don't know how I can describe that government we have. 
we need a lot of your help in order to stop them, to stop the Sudan government in Khartoum by slaughtering its own citizens and enslaving them. And uh, this is one of the things that I'm standing here. I'm really standing here with the people of Darfur and my people, South Sudanese, are standing with them in solidarity, actually. Politically, we're standing with them. So Southern Sudan is still yet unstable. There's nothing we can offer. But I have heard my state, as I said earlier, is one of the closest state to Darfur. There are a lot of refugees from Darfur living there now in a will state, A-W-E-I-L. And something, very surprisingly, I had never been back to Sudan since I left when I was seven. I'm in Southern Sudan part when I was seven. And I left Khartoum when I was 18 in 1998. And I'm going to take a trip back to Sudan this coming year, in January. I'm going to go back to Southern Sudan part. Um, and thank you. The mission I'm going back, the mission I'm going back is to show to our brothers and sisters in Darfur that we have forgiven them. Because they are our former oppressors. They were used by the Sudan government because of the religion to kill us. And I've been actually talking to a lot of Southerners, telling them that we must forgive these people because they were blinded and brainwashed. They didn't know this one day will turn against them. The war in Sudan or the conflict in Sudan is not a religion conflict anymore. It is racism, you know. And they should know that we are all brothers and sisters, you know. And I'm going to go with a delegation of the Lost Boys. Have you ever heard of the Lost Boys and Lost Girl of Sudan? Uh, one of the young pastor, Lost Boy, who lived in Atlanta, uh, Abram Niao, and I, and one of the Lost Boy, uh, you know, a chairman in Kansas City where I live, uh, Simon, and a few Darfurian, uh, and one of the American pastors who quit his job as a pastor at one of the uh, Christ Church in uh, Kansas City, and he was moved by the story that he heard from the Sudanese locally there, and because he didn't do his work properly as a full-time pastor, he quit his job, and he said, I want to do something to help these people. And he had established an organization called Sudan Sunrise, you know, and he actually aimed to help build the reconciliation between South Sudanese and people of Darfur. And I helped him a lot, and he's going to go with us, and 60 Minutes is going to go with us, and we're going to go to my state, and we were seeking for the possibility to go to Chad, and they told us it is absolutely danger to go. So they said the best way you can go to southern Sudan and maybe meet with uh, refugees from Darfur from there in my state, in a will state. And, and that's what we will do early in January. And we will come back and tell the story, you know, but we can't do it alone. We need more than what you have offered today to listen to this story. We need you to uh, think, you know, as individual like you are, what you can do to help, because any one of you can make a huge impact to others, you know. And I really thank the students because it's you students that help bring the peace accord that we have now between the South Sudanese and Northern Sudanese in the South. It's you also would help to bring the peace for the people of Darfur. And I ask for all of you to talk to anyone that you know about this issue to do whatever effort you can make and, and, and be a part of this you know, struggle. And I know if all of us work together, we will win this struggle and we can help to abolish you know, this kind of thing that we still see happening in other nations. This country, I heard, has eight historical. You know, when I first, this is my first time I learned about slavery in the United States in 2001. I learned it through someone that I have a lot of respect to, Dr. Charles Jacobs. I call him my American father. He's the president and co-founder of the American Enslaver Group. 
He's the one that helped me to come to Boston and work with him. And at the Boston Freedom Award, uh, he was actually recognized by, uh, you know, Scratty God King that just passed away a year ago or two. Um, and I did not know her. I did not know her husband. I did not know anything about American, African American in particular. And along, Charles spoke, and he asked me to say a few words. I said, how am I going to say? I don't know much English. I said hello, and I said whatever I said that time. I couldn't remember. And uh, along you know, with her was uh, a mayor of uh, Boston, Thomas Menino. And they present a word, you know, Scripture God King and him, to Charles Jacobs, a Boston Freedom Award. And afterwards, she said she wanted me to come to her hotel room. And she wanted to ask me some questions comfortably. I went with Charles and one of the Sudanese women who were working with one of the uh, local organization there uh, came and she translated for me from Arabic to English. And uh, she said, uh, you know, my husband was a Yero. I said, who is your husband? He said, Dr. Mother Ludum King, he's not with us. He's, he's the man that changed the United States. And maybe one day you will learn about him from school, if you go to school in America. Or maybe one is, you know, America, I mean, African American uh, History Month. You will learn about that. I was interesting to ask a lot of questions. It took one hour for me only to ask questions and one hour for her to ask me questions, two hours we spent. And I thank her a lot afterward. The same day, Charles said, in better to make you understand it, let's pass by uh, Barnes & Noble. He got me a dream speech, you know, tip, video tip. And then also along, he brought uh, uh, a Ten Commandment by the Moses, by the Jewish, because Charles is a Jewish himself. I watched first uh, the dream speech. And I was moved, and I said, wow, he addressed all that people? said yes, and uh, he said, hey, everyone respect him. You know, and respect his legacy. So he's a great man. And then I watched a Ten Commandments about the Moses when the Jewish people were enslaved in uh, Egypt, and Moses said to Pharaoh, let my people go and see open for them. Uh, and now I teach my Jewish friends that, uh, you know, there was a great moment when the sea opened for your people. But yet, sea hasn't opened for my people, you know. And I want you to realize that we are brothers and sisters. And the same thing I say to African American, we are brothers and sisters. Because I heard that your ancestors were enslaved in Africa. Now, you are living comfortably, though that none of these people existing ever experienced. But you must now, something had happened, that's why you are what you are today. So please, let's do this together. Don't say it's not happening here anymore, or it is already abolished it, like I heard in 1865. Now, slavery is not history. It's still even happening here and elsewhere. So actually, that's the time I started my abolitionist. And it was a great thing to study in Boston, because I have learned also Boston is a center of abolitionists. You know, I started speaking locally in Massachusetts and then widely in America, you know, and now I'm continuing doing the same thing. And even as I began growing and my mind is getting bigger and I have all these big dreams, uh, you know, uh, I've done a lot. I had testified to the Congress, you know, I mean, I have spoken to the Congress in Capitol Hill, I had testified to Senate. Uh, with broadcasting live in C-SPAN. I had met President Bush twice in September 4th, 2011, when he was sending a special envoy to Sudan, uh, former senator from Missouri, John Danforth. I had met him, and I had met uh, a former Secretary of State, Colin Powell, and I told him, you have duty to help my people. I had met President Bush in September, or whatever I can remember, it's 2002, at the White House, at the Sudan Peace Act ceremony, when he signed that bill. You know, and I had met almost every senator and every 
Congress. I said, I want to meet them, and I want to talk to them live. And I want to ask them if they know anything about what's going on in Sudan for many years. They always say to me, they know, and they will act. I will say, why you say you will act? You should act now. How many people do you want to see? That's the exact question I ask when I go to UN and speak in New York. I will say, how many people do Kofi Annan want to see die in my country in order to make UN, you know, realize this is what they were found for, actually. I heard there was you know, genocide in Rwanda in 1994. I did not know anything. I would live in my own world. I was actually in slavery. But I learned you know, the UN didn't get there quickly. Now there's a second genocide in southern Sudan where 2 million people have been killed. The more than people killed in Kosovo, Rwanda, and Somalia, and Haiti combined, and Kosovo. There's now action. Now there's the third genocide, and third genocide is within Sudan because we have two genocidal in my country. The third one is now in Darfur region, the current one, and nobody really seemed to be doing anything about it. When are we going to act? So please, let's say to this government, you know, we need to do this now, you know, we need to end this now, we can't wait anymore. So, my friends, I really appreciate your time, and I appreciate every effort that each and one of you are doing to help, you know, and uh, I hope that this story has changed your life and at least assist you with whatever dream you have to help others, you know, and uh, I was in this session, people talking about the students, how you should go to speak, I mean, to go to school in other nations, you know, to learn other cultures, you know, and it is important. I have met, or I met two students to go to my country. I did not tell them, but they have chosen alone to go. I challenged one of the students at Harvard University when I spoke at Kennedy Government School. You know, uh, Jay Williams is African American. When he heard me, he come by and he was crying. He said, Francis, I don't know what to say, but I want to get involved with any organization and I want to go to Sudan. He said, I'm a junior in college year, and I want to go. I said, please, it's not safe to go. He said, I want to go. I don't care if it's not safe. He went, he came back, and he finished his last year at Harvard, and he joined American and said, go for his first job with us. And uh, he traveled back. The same thing, I challenged one of the students, his name, Tommy Calvert, he's from uh, San Antonio, Texas. He was running for the U.S. Congress, <laughs> this campaign. He's a very, very talented kid. And he said, I want to go to Sudan. He went numerous times. And most importantly, high school students, his name, George. I can't remember the last name, but I have his last name, all full name. He was somewhere at one of the high schools in Providence, Rhode Island. I spoke there, and his teacher, his science teacher, told me, this kid doesn't listen. He doesn't do his homework, and so this, and, you know, he told me everything. I said, I know, I, I went to evening high school with some American kids. They take everything for granted. <laughs> and he said, you know, he's, you know, she said, we taking, you know, we took them to Uganda, you know, for a summer trip, and when he went there, we asked the kids what they want to do, because we, we got there and there's many, many refugees from your country and especially they are your tribe, Dinka, my tribe. And we asked students what they can volunteer to do with these children. It was mixed adults, people my age, 20 something. And this kid chose to, he said he's gonna teach them computer. You know, and uh, he said in his class it was mixed age, people from age 11 to 20 something. And he was teaching them and when he came in, they greet him, you know, with the native song. And they don't sit down until he tells them to sit down, you know. And uh, when he left, everyone was crying. Uh, and he came back. When I spoke there, he's the one who was introducing me. And he said, my life, it totally changed. I never realized that I can do something. I can impact someone in some other people's life. He said, I used to cheat myself. It's not a lie. But now I'm doing everything in my best to be professional, and I can't wait every summer to go and do whatever I can do to those refugees. 
This is something that is important to go other side of other nations and you know learn other experiences and other cultures. I'm not recommending something that you can do as priority, but your leaders, your you know professor who are talking about this, it is something an agenda that you may be required to go. So I want to give you this few minutes left. I always want to talk to you about everything because this is a chance for me, a chance for my people, a chance for 27 million people that can be here to talk, each of them talk about their experiences. So it is now your turn to ask me any question you have. And I want to say once again, I have really, really appreciate your hospitality to have me be here with you. And I appreciate this school and I appreciate the organization that sponsored me, especially the office of, uh, I heard, uh, perspective, what? Global, yeah, global perspective. I really appreciate them a lot along with the list of many other sponsors, you know, and I want to thank John once again and all the team that work hard to make this happen. Please, if you do have any question for me, don't hesitate and don't feel that there's no silly question for me. I talk to all ages of people and I always, even adults ask me a question they don't know and it's always, even when I was learning English, I ask any question that you can ask. <laughs> But I do ask because that's how you learn something you don't know. Thank you so much for having me.